Welcome to, uh, I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Board of Trustees for the Monroe County Public Library. Uh, we'll start as usual by introducing ourselves and if you care to share what you're reading, please do. Fred, you want to start us off? Um, I just finished that biography of Hitler that I told you about. Um, my name is Fred Reisinger. Ari Essary, and I just finished Cloud Cuckoo Land, which is um, by Anthony Doerr. Um, I really loved All the Light You Cannot See, and this is another good one. Pretty new. I'm Chris Harrison, and I'm reading The World Between Blinks. I'm Marilyn Wood, and I'm reading um, A Promised Land by Barack Obama. John Walsh, I'm rereading Frank Herbert's Dune before seeing the new movie. I'm David Ferguson, I'm reading someone else's recommendation, The Splendid and the Vile. Was that you? All right, that's good. Jamie Burkhart and I just picked up uh, the book New Kid. Kathy Loser, and I'm just starting The Midnight Library by um, Matt Haig. We've heard of that one around this table before also. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. And do we have a motion to approve our consent agenda, which includes minutes, monthly financial report, monthly bills for payment, personnel report, and our board meeting calendar? We have a motion and a second. Uh, any questions, comments, clarifications? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And I'll turn it over to Marilyn for highlights from her monthly report. Thanks. So I have a few items to highlight, um, mostly about content and programs. We also have an update from Steph uh, Niemeyer tonight uh, on access and content, so I won't steal her thunder on all those things, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the projects that we're working on now. Uh, one of them uh, that you would have seen in the director's re report was about our local yearbooks. We are doing a digitization project <clears throat> to, uh, to put all of our local yearbooks online. And many of them, the content has been received uh, back and we're working on the descriptive text uh, for about 148 years of yearbooks and high school, uh, high school yearbooks. I think that's only fair if you go to every other hometown of all the trustees and put theirs on. Oh, up there too. Ah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Too. It has university awesome. school. I used to have uh, those in the library at North. Yeah, some of those um, are already available. There's mm -hmm. certainly an index that, that describes cool. some of those. Uh, but anyway, uh, those will be available, uh, we hope, in the second quarter of 2022. We're working on it right now, but I think Steph can provide additional answers to any of our questions about what those are. The yearbooks themselves mm -hmm. will be searchable. Yes, Super. they are. You may have to... I, uh, well, I'll let her speak to this more in a moment, but I won't, I won't get in there where I may not know what I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, we partnered with IU on an IU Science Fest program this year. Uh, it was really where care, caregivers and children came to explore science topics. It was held at IU, but they had a map of how to get to the library and to our garden, our children's garden where uh, one of our building services staff members uh, had constructed a giant scale. And so kids came back and they were able to put uh, bean bags on it. And so it was a very interactive program that uh, related to science in a real fun and positive way. And then another thing that we partnered on this uh, past month was the Monroe County Childhood Conditions Summit, which was held at the library. And there were about 140 uh, community <coughs> part, excuse me, participants <coughs> And uh, it was a chance um, to really bring people together to talk about development and brain development of, of kids. And Lisa Ciampelli was one of the uh, planning team members and she presented opening remarks to that program. So I'm happy to answer any other questions about the director's report. Thank you, Marilyn. 
And moving on to old business, we have an update on the southwest branch from Greer. I'll actually give or that from Maryland. because there is none. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have anything new to report other than uh, we hope that we'll be breaking ground any day. They were awaiting the final permits, uh, which were received late last week. Smithville contract? The Smithville contract is an old business because it's very similar to the contracts that we that we talked about for the downtown and Ellisville library. This one, however, is for new service. So this contract um, is uh, for a similar kind of service, um, contract language, et cetera, uh, but it will be for the Southwest Branch Library. And they will, as it goes, um, the they will install but we won't pay until service is actually turned on so this is just in advance to ensure that we have service availability but any this, questions this, on either of those items smithville would require uh, an approval oh i'm sorry yeah okay do we have a motion to approve the um new uh, smithville contract for service to the southwest branch i move that we approve it we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor of approving the contract with Smithville for service to the Southwest Branch, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And this is an action item? The new business okay. is, an, yes, is an action item also. Uh. Do we have a motion to approve the 2022 ARPA grant uh, to approve the appropriation of funds? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. This is also a resolution to establish a fund for this as a, as a federal grant. Good evening, very briefly, um, earlier this year, we requested and received funds to purchase additional field equipment uh, for CATS to better enable our CATS crew to provide hybrid local meeting coverage and participation on the part of the public. This is important because we have seen an increase in virtual meeting attendance and participation since the onset of COVID, but more importantly, we feel this is something that's very likely to continue even after we emerge from the pandemic. So this grant is part of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 and as a federal grant with funds distributed by way of the Indiana State Library, we are required to establish an ARPA grant fund and to approve the appropriation of those funds. So tonight we have a resolution to establish the fund line and to approve the appropriation of the funds. Any questions or discussion? What was the amount of the funds that you received? 18,000 and change, correct? I don't know what the exact number is. I wrote it down somewhere and didn't bring it with me. What is some of the, what is some of the equipment to buy with it? It's very specific, $17,707.67. Um, some of the equipment includes uh, studio racks for the control room, um, microphones, audio monitors, HD web presenters, smart panels, LCD rack mount monitors, and a whole host of CAT specific equipment that I'm not gonna to pretend to describe effectively. Um, but we work closely with, uh, with CATS on identifying what this equipment list would be, what they would do with it. And we're excited to put it out in the field to see how it works. Yeah, thank you. All in favor of approving the resolution to establish an American Rescue Plan Act grant fund and approve appropriation of funds, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And now we have an update on uh, the 2021 Pioneer Grant from Sam Ott. Laura Wise and Edwin Falwell. And I will give you a short uh, preview of what this means. So on an annual basis, the Library Administration and the Library Innovation Grant Team 
uh, entertains funding requests for projects that benefit uh, our patrons. The grants are awarded from Friends of Library Funding, and the grants are designed to support a range of library initiatives, including programs, services, and collections, such as a one-time or a series of programs, pilot collections, and new services for targeted audiences. The grant team seeks to invest in projects that are forward-thinking, impactful on patron experience, practical, and sustainable in their application. In recent years, the amount of the grants has ranged from $400 to $1,500. Highest priority in the evaluation of grant proposals is given to proposals that incorporate and embrace alignment with the library's mission, imaginative, innovative, or transformative solutions to critical patron issues or needs, contributing to the development of a knowledgeable, inclusive, diverse, and engaged community empowered by the library, and demonstration of outcomes and their measurements. So today we have last year's winners, and they're gonna describe for you their project. Hello everybody, I'm Sam. I'm one of the teen librarians here at the library. And I'm Laura, I'm also in the teen department. My name is Edwin, I work uh, in adult services and level up. Mm -hmm. So we chose role playing games. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but it's just a, a type of game that you can play with a group of friends. Uh, but we chose that as uh, the item we wanted to circulate because it has experienced a resurgence in popularity in the past six years, and it's also very popular with teen and new adult audiences, as well as tween audi audiences as well. Um, and it promotes collaboration and critical thinking uh, because players create this shared narrative space that they can guide and interact with. Um, and then it also creates a community and fosters interactive storytelling mediums. Um, and so our kits in the library include all of the parts that are necessary to play. Uh, so this reduces the barrier of cost and personal resources, uh, just trying to make it as accessible as possible. And then it also creates opportunities for the library to step in and facilitate collaboration, creativity, and connection with these shared interests. So we really wanted to make sure that there were circulatable, self-contained RPG experiences because one of the issues a lot of people have when they want to try out new games are that the games are fairly expensive, oftentimes 40 or $50 just for one booklet. And so by providing that, we can let people kind of check that out and experience it together before they commit those funds and they can you know, try a whole bunch of different options instead. And we really wanted to make sure that this was available for adults because currently we have a lot of RPG experiences available for tweens and teens but not necessarily as many available for adults. This kind of creates a little more equity in that area. Um, it also allows us to just provide it for all, all audiences in general. It also promotes the library as a place that offers unconventional materials. We currently have the Library of Things available where these live, but with the building of the Southwest Branch and the Teaching Kitchen, we thought that they would be likely we'll start to add more things to that collection, so this fits in very well. They are offering kind of unconventional materials. It also connects with the library's strategic goals because cooperative storytelling through RPGs is a creative social activity that allows participants to connect with one another, promotes reading, and encourages lifelong learning. So these kits allow the library to be at the center of that connection. And we actually brought one with us today. So inside of the kits, we wanted to make sure that we had everything players would need. So we made sure to provide um, an adventure module that has what the game master or can lead everybody through so they don't have to create it. There's one that's already there. We also made sure to provide all the dice because a lot of times there are very specific dice you need to play these adventures. Character sheets and uh, grids so that the player can go through that. And also just a basic manual that allows everybody to get on the same page and read through that so that way everybody has exactly what they need. And if you're interested, we'll have this available on the table so you can check that out. So our most well used kits have been our D&D kits, our Dungeons and Dragons kits. It's a very traditional role playing game and a very popular one. We anticipated this and so we created more of those kits. Uh, there are two different versions of it uh, and four kits in total. Uh, another kit that took us a bit by surprise was uh, Monster of the Week. It's a Buffy the Vampire Slayer sort of themed game where uh, adventurers go on episodic uh, adventures and try to slay the monster. Um, so these items have been highly desired by patrons. Uh, more than half of all of the checkouts are coming, are stemming from pl patrons placing those items on hold, which is a really good rate of utilization for the library of things. Um, these items are also circulating at a pretty high rate. About 60% of all the available time that an item it exists in the library, it's checked out and in a patron's care. 
Um, yeah, so if you guys have any questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Is it the same cycle? Yes, it is the okay. same three week cycle as other types of materials like it. Have you gotten any response from the players? Yeah, well, a lot of anecdotal evidence. Mm -hmm. um, we've had players come in and excitedly tell us about Look, yes. this cool new thing I found upstairs because. Uh, We'll have teens come into the teen space happy that they discovered this mm -hmm. and we're like, oh yeah, that, yep. what a good idea. <laughs> so yeah, no, uh, people have had a chance to try out some new games that they've never had an opportunity to play that they've always kind of desired to. And so providing those opportunities for people to explore different ways of doing these kinds of like shared social storytelling is pretty exciting for us. You mentioned the instruction manuals or sheets are there is that one for everyone to share or are there multiple copies of that you know there's one for everybody to share um, so it's essentially like a resource guide where you can uh, play the game without it but you can go back to it if you have questions um, so everybody in the group should be able to just play with one and then the module contains multiple adventures for the one person leading the group so you can check this out with multiple different experiences each time. So there are no consumable products in there? Correct, yeah. The only thing that might be consumed is a wet erase marker that we could replace. Um, but we do have some uh, replaceable items already in stock to change those out. Yeah. As part of our grant funds, we made sure to purchase um, additional items for things like markers or dice. So that way, if those things got lost during the kits, uh, ACS would have those available to restock around. So the player sheets, those are reusable? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. oh, I was just going to say they're laminated, and that's why we provide the wet erase I marker see. to make sure we mm -hmm. don't have to keep printing off copies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when Laura did a lot of the work, Laura and Edwin, on those character sheets, we made sure to then upload those in a dr Google Drive folder for ACS so that if they lose any of those, they can just reprint that and laminate it and have it available again. That way it's not something they have to ever hunt for. Have, has this been, like, marketed out there that these are at the library? Indeed, yeah. So uh, our marketing team has done a really good job of promoting these through Facebook. I believe we've had uh, posts on Instagram. Mm -hmm. We've cross-posted on our teen Instagram as well. And um, we also have a D&D &D podcast yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that was done in, uh, somewhat in support of this. And mm -hmm. you guys have certainly mentioned that several mm -hmm. times that yep. we have these available. And any plans that you can make more or is it pretty much maxed out? That would be a question that we'd have to work with ACS, but... Yeah, I would love to make more <laughs> because there are uh, a lot of other games that um, have more diverse creators, too, that we can access and make sure that um, everybody feels represented. But that's also if, if we have the money for ACS. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. Do they um, have a room here that they use, or do they use it to check it out and do it at home? Yeah. They, there's a the Library of Things space upstairs where El Centro was located before. Uh, they moved into the Indiana Rooms, a uh, former office. Uh, that area contains a number of different Library of Things things that staff perhaps can speak more to. And I do know that some people do check them out and use them in like the study rooms upstairs. We had a few teens check them out just because they want the, the adventure module for something they're playing. They'll use it in the ground floor and then leave. But a lot of people would ideally play them like out in the community or in their homes. Um, I imagine like the role playing games are good because there aren't a lot of like cards or pieces mm -hmm. that can get lost and then, you know, mess up the game. But are there, I assume there are public libraries that have more or less extensive collections of other tabletop games. And do we have that or have we talked about that? So that's a conversation we've had on and off for a few years, but we've never been able to really nail down how we would, you know, catalog those or like circulate them or check them. There are some interesting systems Edwin found that use uh, like a baking scale where when an item is returned, you have a certain amount of weight that if it's off by, you'll open the board game and check it for lost pieces. Otherwise, you don't. But again, that's something that we'd have to talk a lot with Steph about because <laughs> the processing of those items when you have like 200 loose pieces inside there would be right. a bit of a nightmare sometimes. But we're excited to continue looking at that just because these kits show that you know people really do want that. And I've had anecdotally several families during the pandemic ask me like, do you have board games that you circulate that we could play at home? Mm -hmm. So I think there is a desire for that that we'd like to explore. We do have board games in the library. Mm -hmm. And very serious where people can play, mm -hmm. but it's just not a circulating item. Well, thank you very much. Thank it's you. a very cool and exciting project. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much.
Back to our desks. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, this is a uh, Disney theme, yes. <laughs> And next we have our update on access and content services from Steph Niemeyer. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Steph Niemeyer, the access and content services manager, as you know. I started here in April of 2019 as the assistant manager of ACS under Greer Carson and then moved to the role of manager in November of 2020. I'd like to also introduce our new Assistant Manager of Access and Content Services. Will Scharfenberger is not able to be here tonight, but they were hired in May of 2021 and have taken up the direct oversight of our second floor staff. They've been a pleasure to work with and I'm really happy to have them on board. So you may already know, but Access and Content Services oversees the acquisition, preparation, and processing of all of our physical materials, the acquisition and maintenance of all of our digital collection, and we're responsible for, responsible for the proper organization of our physical items and of our online catalog. To summarize, we buy, prep, check-in, shelve, edit, and pull literally everything that the library circulates, streams, or provides. 2020 and 2021 have been interesting years for everyone, and MCPL and ACS are no exception. We've adapted to changes in building and collection use and have closely monitored our physical and digital collections as the trends that we're used to have been relatively uncertain. Throughout 2021, use of our physical collection has been slowly increasing. In August of this year, we finally reached 200,000 items checked out or renewed, a number we've not seen since February of 2020. And while we're still working towards our 2019 levels of overall use, some use and services have regained some normalcy. For example, the total number of holds on items that have been requested so far in 2021 is almost 274,000 which averages out to more a month than we were experiencing in 2019. Our order, or I lost my place here. Okay, so yeah, our ordering and acquisitions of new items in 2021 is also close to our 2019 levels. In 2019, we averaged about 3,900 items ordered monthly. And in 2021, we've been ordering almost 36,000 items monthly. Digital collection use has been slowly decreasing, which is a trend that we expected after such high use in 2020. Um, but even though the use has decreased, the relative use to 2019 per month is still much higher. So that indicates to us that our digital collections are strong and are, have even been gaining in popularity. Freegal, Hoopla, and Overdrive remain our most popular digital resources, and Canopy, Ancestry, and Worldbook remain a close second. I've been working closely with our non-print selector, Brandon Rome, to find the right balance in our e-content budget as we adapt to these changes in use. Our ACS catalogers have completed a variety of projects to ensure that our collections remain accessible to our patrons. Some highlights include consolidating all labeling of items to ACS to ensure consistency, creating some new material types um, for items to better classify them in our online catalog, We've cleaned up the cataloging of holiday AV items to ensure consistency across both of our branches. And we've updated the labels of our juvenile first chapter books to include a prefix instead of indicating that collection by a sticker. So as you've heard a little bit about, we've also been steadily enhancing our Library of Things collection. The Library of Things was born from a need to circulate these more non-traditional items like RPG kits. It started with book club kits, hotspots, and energy monitors and has since expanded into a seemingly ever-growing collection to house all of our things. We created an adult library of things collection and a juvenile library of things collection to better serve the specific audiences. The adult collection has its own room on the second floor of the downtown library and our juvenile collections are housed in the children's departments at both libraries. In 2021 alone, we added the following things to that collection. 30 additional mobile hotspots, we have a total of 50. 10 cellular enabled iPads, three mobile video production kits, 11 role playing game kits, four calculators, six 16 gigabyte flash drives, and five one terabyte external hard drives. That collection also includes adult book club kits, adventure backpacks, energy monitors, juvenile toys, juvenile story time kits, juvenile launch pads, and juvenile book club kits. 
We do anticipate this collection to continue to grow in size and direction, and we're envisioning ways to circulate things like kitchen gadgets and cookware to complement our Southwest Branches teaching kitchen, as well as things like yard and garden tools to complement our seed library. And finally, I'd like to discuss our digitization initiative. In late 2020, we sent our first batch of yearbooks to Easter Seals Crossroads in, in Indianapolis to be digitized. And we've since received the scans for the 200, I, I have 244, but I think that number was a little different. Um, unique years of Bloomington, Ellettsville, Steinsville, and Edgewood schools, and are now working to upload those 40,874 pages to Content DM and complete the final edits and alternative text to increase the accessibility of that collection. Um, I think I heard a question earlier, will it be searchable online? It'll be completely searchable. It has OCR, and then one of my staff members has been adding that alternative text to increase the, that accessibility. And then in September of this year, we shipped a second batch of yearbooks to Easter Seals Crossroads, totaling 98 unique years of some additional schools around town, as well as the 2021 editions of Bloomington and Edgewood schools. So the website holding all of this information is still in draft form. We're not ready to share it yet, but we're nearing a point of being able to share at least the, the URL with, with all of our community. We hope that this searchable digital yearbook collection increases access and use of our yearbooks, and we're proud of the accessibility initiatives that we've taken in adding that alt text, which describes those extra images for visually impaired users. We do intend to maintain a relationship with Easter Seals Crossroads and continue to digitize newly published yearbooks. Um, but as this big project comes to a close, our investment in digitization going forward can be routed to other projects, of which I've already received a few proposals. So that's all I have for now. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the highlight of ACS from 2020 slash 2021, and thanks for your continued support. Years that were gapped that you didn't have in certain schools that you had to do some research to find those. I think we had just a few years. Um, I, I I'd have to look at all of our statistics. I think it was just a few though. There were some years where we had multiple copies, but both copies were like had pictures cut out of them or pages oh. missing, and we had to just pick the better of the two, or in some instances, instances, we sent both copies and requested, here's these pages of this one, please take these pages of this one, so that we'd have a complete set. High school librarians to see what they had in their collection, or was this your own collection? This was, your, to your start, it was just our own collection, but I have been reaching out to folks um, at Harmony School and, um, I think we have a contact at MCCSC. I haven't, I, haven't been, I haven't been in touch with them lately, but we have been getting donations of some of the bigger gaps we've had from Harmony, which is fun. Yeah? Do we have our own content DM or do we use the state libraries? We have our own. We still have access to the state libraries, but we're uploading this to ours. Who owns the copyright on the yearbooks and do you have to deal with that? I believe the schools still do. Um, we've asked them if there's any issue. They, have, they haven't said yes, so. Thanks, we're excited about it. In the 1990s, it Ooh. didn't work very well. <laughs> it's nice to be able to have someone else do all of the scanning yeah. for us, for sure. Well, thank you very much. The, um, Access and content services doesn't always get the same recognition as like programming and summer reading program, but without content, we don't really have a library. So thank you for all your work and your team. And um, it was really content that kept us going all through the pandemic when we couldn't do many of the other things we do. So thank you for all your work. Thank you. And it's time for public comment. If there are members of the public who would write, like to address the board, please come to the podium, state your name, and share your thoughts.